I want to start off with a terrible prediction, if you will, a prediction that I hope does not come to fruition, but a prediction nonetheless. And I don't want to see this happen, but I'm bringing it to your attention because it is a possibility. It has been rumored for a while that what President Trump may say is to Letitia James, as far as his properties, his Trump Tower and others, he might say, in effect, take it. Take it. Go ahead and take it. Take the building. Take the property. Take it. From what I understand, Trump only has the... Uh, I think it's the retail property and his apartment, but he does not own from what I, and I may be completely, completely in error regarding this. And if I am, please let me know, but he may be absolutely positively only, um, it has ownership interest, equity interest in the actual, um, retail which I don't think there's really much retail there at all, much less other than the gift shop and that little eatery thing at the, at the basement or the, the first level. And, but what I fear, and there's another property he owns, I think 50% or something, Sixth Avenue. Or, but here's what I fear. And this is what I think is going to happen. I do not believe this out of the question. But I believe that Tish James, the attorney general, or or whoever runs her show, th this is not, she's not doing this. Letitia James has absolutely nothing to do with it. She's the titular attorney general. She is theoretically in charge, but other people are pulling the strings. They are involved in what's going on, not Tish James. You know it, and I know it. She has had a bevy and a and a, a veritable cadre of lawyers and legal teams helping her through this. And there is no way she plucked out of nowhere this obscure statute, this, this executive law that provides for this particular vehicle that we heard of. So we'll talk about that. Talk about Riley Gaines. Talk about the latest Kate telepathy. Uh, oh, just so much stuff tonight. So, so much. I am so glad that I retrieved Mrs. L from her trip to Albany. She was been gone. She was up since three this morning. She is back working hard, pounding the pavement along with concerned women and mothers to pass legislation. We're going to have her give you an update on what the, j j just fighting through Albany. I'm so proud of her. Where other people sit back and tweet, which is very important, don't get me wrong, she is out there with mothers who's, who have lost children by virtue of this incredible influence minefield called social media. But we'll do that. Friends, please like the video. Please subscribe to what we're doing. Make sure you subscribe. Make sure that your subscription is still there and still good and still valid. I ask this of you. I really do. It's very, very important. Also, make sure you like these videos. Liking is critical for us. And also, you have responded incredibly because you recognize the fact that there is an absolute need, a very serious need, to be aware and cognizant of what would you do in the event of a food emergency. Food, water, energy. That is the most important thing you will ever need. Think about it. When all is lost and it hits the fan. So listen, my friends, take note and listen like you've never listened before. Let's talk about a very serious subject, emergency food. That's right, emergency food. Now, I know at first blush, it's difficult for most people to think about something that they just, just take for granted, ever reaching, you know, emergency status. 
We're used to stores always being open, deliveries always made, no supply chain disasters, no, no ransomware catastrophes, you know, shutting down gas stations, no trucking strikes, no war, no protests from farmers, no mysterious Chinese weather balloons, nothing, nothing catastrophic in terms of weather. Well, that can't happen to us, right? And I understand it's a defense mechanism that we have because the idea of ever not being able to eat or locate food is seemingly incomprehensible to most people. But think about this. It's not. That's why it's time for you to go to my site, preparewithlionel.com. Preparewithlionel.com has the deal of deals for you. Take it as a, as a starter set, an introduction set. You've been putting off emergency food for too long. Some people still have a thing about prepping as though prepping for emergency is foolish. Now, right now, you can save $200 on a three-month emergency supply kit. This is unbelievable. 22 varieties with a 25-year shelf life, 25 years, 2,000 calories a day in six rugged buckets, 120 pounds of food. Could you go three months, 90 days if stores closed? Be honest. Could you go a week without any trips to the store? I don't think so. I'm not talking about having stuff in your cabinet. I'm not talking about banana chips and jerky. I'm talking about food, real food. So go right now to preparewithlionel.com. This moment right now, preparewithlionel.com, preparewithlionel.com. Go now and thank me later. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't even know where to start, my dear, dear friend, my dear friend. I want to I want to tell you that later on this evening, and by the way, members of Lionel Nation get this early, but I'm announcing that I am changing. I'm going to convert. To a 27-year-old, six foot three, 250 pound French African American woman named LaShandra Jackson. I am changing because if Leah Thomas can be a woman, I can be LaShandra Jackson. I can be French. I can change the color of my eyes by just telling you this. This is the most absurd thing that taxes our ability to even focus, okay? You are under attack. What is considered normal, what is considered rational, is under attack so that you give up, okay? You have been told this. You have been, you have been told, yes, this makes sense. Oh, this is, this is rational. No, it's not. It's not rational, dear friends. None of it is. Do you hear me? Of course you do. Of course you hear me. Now, I want to tell you something, too, and I just saw this. Let me go back. So right off the bat, what they're going to do is they're going to take, they're going to take as many of Trump's properties as possible and make them uh, homeless shelters. That's what I believe Letitia James wants to do. Take whatever property she can and make homeless shelters. They will lose money. The question is, does she have a fiduciary duty to stockholders? To Can she run it into the ground? Remember, it's not Letitia James. She is not running this. She doesn't know anything about how to run buildings. She doesn't do this. She is the, she is the Agino, Attorney J, a General in name only, Agino. Sounds like a gynecologist, isn't it? Agino. AG in name only. She is part of this desperate move, desperate move to bring Trump down. And there will be nothing that would destroy him theoretically than to bring a bunch of homeless cavalcades, coteries, covens, cadres, convocations of Venezuelan rapists and in, in, uh, giving swag bags, a thousand bucks, phone cards, an Obama phone, and say, go ahead, tear it up. Think I'm kidding? How many of you great people think that I'm just, I'm out of my tree? There's no way this is going to happen. You, you, you think that's possible? You damn right it's possible. You damn right it's possible. Okay? Damn right it's possible. So let me just explain this to you, okay? Let me just put this into perspective. That is happening. You're also being told that, hey, Kate's found, so... What's the big deal? That's her picture. That's that's her picture. And in this piece, by the way, Riley Gaines, 
this this story, which is just so absolutely incredible. She is suing the NAA, uh, NAACP, <laughs> NCAA. She and 15 others are suing, basically claiming that Title IX is being eliminated because Title IX seeks to secure the rights of female athletes. Ladies, they're going after your gender. Let me, let me explain something to you. For some reason, you have mistaken this as to believing somehow that men, that men, that, that men are under attack, that, that, that men are uh, in the offing or in the, in the, in the, in the crosshairs that men, no, it's not men. It's not men. Uh-uh. Nope. Women. They're destroying women. They're destroying you. They don't need you anymore. It's not men they're going after. See, that's the thing. When a man transitions into a woman artificially, like Leah Thomas, it's not that he's abandoning his manhood. He's contaminating womanhood. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're after you. This is misogyny. This is this is basically a a a the, the 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 chance to extinguish you. Do you understand that? The chance to extinguish you. This is extinction, expunction, the biologic nullification of women. You are irrelevant because you're being replaced by men. Do I have to, do I have to, you, you tell me you understand this. See, this is always made like, oh, what about the boys? What about the boys? We're losing our boys. We're losing our women. Boys are doing fine. It's the women. Why do you think that is? Why? What's the purpose? We could spend for the rest of our life trying to figure this one out. Now, who wants to get really freaked out? Who wants to really get freaked out? I'm, I'm going to tell you something that I believe for the long time. Now, when I say I believe this, I don't really believe because I don't have proof. But let me tell you what I believe in. There's a story about the first uh, bionic man, incredible moment, human patient implanted with Neuralink, brain chip, plays chess using telepathy. As he's revealed to be a 29-year-old Arizona quadriplegic paralyzed in a freak diving accident. Well, you do know we've had this before. There have been people, there have been individuals, amputees, who have been able to work um, uh, uh, prosthetic uh, limbs by virtue of telepathy. You know that, right? You know that, right? You know that, right? Of course. You know that. You know that. Yes. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You know that. I'm going to tell you something that I, I don't say I believe this, but I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I have the hardest time dealing sometimes with, with this one here. Eric Weinstein and others have trying to, the, the smartest people in the world have tried to deal with the fact that we have been visited on a number of occasions by people, by things, by entities that have absolutely nothing to do with anything that we can normally recognize as being whatever. They have flown, and some of them have been certainly, they have to be. And, and I don't know this for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if they were military prototypes, if they were private sector prototypes, if they were military contractual. I wouldn't be surprised if any of that were true. Do you hear what I'm saying? I would not be surprised if any of that were true. I would not in any wise be surprised if that were true. Okay? Okay. Now, let me put it into this way. Let me put it into perspective this way. Since time immemorial, human beings have reported that they have seen and they have come into contact with people in a variety of ways. Some have claimed being abducted. Some have claimed... Um, um, impregnation, whatever. 
Some of them were nuts. Some of them weren't. There are some of these people who have claimed to have been uh, religious people who have uh, been insane hearing the voice of God. I wouldn't necessarily negate the existence of God just because some crazy person uh, uh, connects with them. I don't think that's fair. People always say, that. oh, that's crazy. How many times have you ever seen, remember the end is near, the end is nigh, Jesus repent. You see, we used to have them here all the time. We don't see them anymore, but there were, people would be, one on Broadway, he was there right around the Brill Building, not, not too far. He was there all the time with his sign, repent, repent. You never see Jews say that. You never see Muslims or Zoroastrians. It's always Christians. Does that mean that Christianity is bogus? Of course not. Just because I'm drunk or some idiot or some drunk idiot, uh, some lunatic uh, connects with it? Not at all. But a while back, there was a fellow named Philip Corso. And Philip Corso gave this interesting story. And they immediately tried to dispute him. Uh, Stan Friedman did it. Others did it as well. They really... They they did not like him. I think because he wasn't a member of the club. There were a bunch of uh, dare I say mean girls in the world of this stuff, and I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. There are mean girls who um, you're you're not the you're you're not part of the cool kids. So there was three things that he did. It was called the day after Roswell was his book. It's very interesting. Number one. He said that in 1947, when the shit hit the fan, this is when Roswell and hit, they, they learned from this the following, through reverse engineering. Number one, night vision goggles, by, this is his words, taking the lenses of these rather large, these almond-shaped, whatever, either, either taking the actual lens or uh, analogizing, extrapolating from what they learned from it. I don't know, but that's number one. Night vision, uh, goggles, vision, whatever it was. Number two, fiber optics. That they learn fiber optics through the interesting circuitry. Number three, the transistor, which apparently was all of a sudden, this thing came out of nowhere. And the thing that was the most important was telepathy. There was a story I read, and I'll never forget this. I don't know if it's true. Don't know. But think about this. I want you to clear your mind. I want you to clear your mind and think about this. You are a nurse and you are to check on one of these critters that they found. I, I don't know if they if they can handle our atmosphere or whatever. I don't know. But let, just, just, just go with this. okay? And the story is that the nurse walks into this room and all of a sudden this thing's talking to her. She's hearing and feeling a conversation that she's never felt before in her life. She's never heard this before. She's never experienced this before. She's freaking out. It's not a voice she's hearing. It's it's a conversation. And, and it's not a question of, of, of words. And she hears this critter, this gray, this whatever talk to him. It's not that. She just knows. It's telepathy. Telepathic communication. It is further positive by some people. Again, you don't have to believe it. Just think about this. Just imagine this. The reason why there is no mouth, the reason why they don't they don't have a mouth, they don't make noise. That is that is that is ridiculous. That is so um uh impractical that is so unnecessary. It's a use it's a waste of flesh. They are basically hatched communicating. Telepathy is the only way to speak. Now, how you turn off this, I don't know. When you walk into a room, do you hear everybody's, are they all talking to you? How, in the middle of the night, can you sleep? If somebody's sending a message, can you put your, your telepathy on, on, on sleep cycle? I don't know these things. I don't know these things. I've often wondered, what if, what if you don't want this? But the point is, hear me out. So, it was also posited, it was also hypothesized that the reason why these things have little mouths is that they speak, they communicate via telepathy. And number two, the reason why they're spindly is because of the fact that they're, they don't need all this bulk and muscle and, and they don't eat. They basically um, respirate, respirare, conspirare, conspiracy to breathe with spirit. 
Ooh. Anyway, the theory, the hypothesis, that which is posited is that they their energy basically works on the premise of of um, photosynthesis. That's the way they 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 don't need they don't eat and they don't anyway. And if you think about something that was pretty advanced, that'd be pretty good. So what am I saying? What is this about? What I'm saying is that one of the things that is believed that we learned from this retroengineering is telepathy. And we're getting this out. We never, sometimes we, 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 we see it, but we don't know how to actually connect with it. Some things we cannot do. They don't leave an instruction manual. We don't sit down with, uh, with Mork from Ork and he explains things. So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be seeing little things like this. And what people have been doing, it is believed, is that at the highest levels, they have kept this the most quiet. And that the reason why, the reason why people don't know about this is not because of, of security clearance on the part of the president. In fact, the president does not have the highest security clearance. It is believed, it has been said, that there are levels higher and they are called um, normally the five letter names, ultra, umbra, zebra, cobra, whatever. Those are like the, and I think zebra, they said at one point was the ultimate, ultimate, might be three people on the planet who even have it. Now, Republic Room, thank you. I like which is deep. This is real. Republic Room, I want to thank you. I want you to know something. I am not crazy. I've not seen one of these people. I cannot say that I believe in this. But when you were Maxwell, or if you were uh, one of the original physicists and you came up with the notion of, of, of dark energy or dark matter or the electron, you don't see it. You don't see it, but you see evidence of it. I don't see the wind, but I see the evidence of the wind. I know there's a wind. I can feel the wind, but I can't see it. I can't. And there are people, the number one, the number one conspiracy theory of them all, and I use that in terms of their negative term, is UFOs. Human beings cannot discuss the subject. They cannot. Eric Weinstein, who I really enjoy, is almost a gatekeeper. Oh, um, um, Sagan, absolutely gatekeeper number one. Neil deGrasse Tyson, numero uno. Neil deGrasse Tyson got into trouble years ago. He was in the clear. He kind of that kind of went away, which is good. They basically told him, "Okay, we'll make this go away, but we own you." And there's one thing we will do. If we find out that you ever so much as intimate that there's anything to this, we will cut your balls off and put them on the wall next to anybody else. Bill Nye, the science guy, notice he's gone. I don't know if he ever went too far. Michio Kaku, Gesundheit. Michio Kaku was, uh, he was as close to it. Uh, uh, um, uh, the, um, oh God, Nancy, um, what the hell's her name? Jacobson, wherever she's, she, not Jacobson, um, Nancy, you know what I'm talking about, this great, but DARPA and whatever it is, uh, you know what I'm talking about. What is her name? Nancy, Nancy, help me out. Nancy, Nancy, she's very good. She she has an, uh, that ASMR voice. Nancy, Nancy, ah, uh, no, no, that's not Nancy. Uh, DARPA. What is her name? What is, what is her name? Oh, for God's sakes. Annie Jacobson. Nancy. Annie Jacobson. I was close. Annie Jacobson. She's very good. They let Annie get away with some of this. They let her say she she could put she's a toe in the water type. A little bit, a little toe. Go and say some things. Uh, uh Keen was one. She was very good as well. There is a mystery behind this that is so fascinating. Second only to Minta, um, IA, or 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 
AI, I should say. Artificial intelligence and artificial general intelligence, I think right now is my number one stay up late while it's like being high, man, without being high. Just letting your brain go crazy and really getting into the depth of some wild stuff is um, AGI. That's the thing. Creating consciousness. Creating consciousness. Creating a superhuman and an ubermenschen sort of thing. Oh, this this blows my mind. Second to that is the idea of a life form. And the thing you have to do is you have to disabuse yourself of the normal biases. Why don't you get out of the vehicle? Why don't you stretch your legs? Why don't you want to talk to us? Why don't you... I don't even know what the... Why, why do you... Uh, why are you an anal probe? Why do you go after hillbillies and trailer parks? Let me ask you something. Ask me a question. What would be the first thing that you would do if you went to another area and saw people, new life forms, what would be the first thing you would do? You'd capture them. What's the first thing that we do when we see anything? A new spider, a new bug, a new bird, a new that We capture it. First thing we do. We explore it. We look at it. How does it mate? How does it reproduce? What does it do? We do tests. We're like, I don't want to compare it to like Mengalas, but Sort of, because we would think nothing of another life form. We take animals, we destroy animals. We, through husbandry, through hunting, we eat them, fillet them, pen them, put them in zoos, stare at them, anything that we consider to be below us. And we swear that we love them. We swear we love animals. We, we love, but what's the first thing we do? You would want to know what, how these humans work, how they, how they, how do they reproduce? And, you would want to try to intermix, intermingle. Be like meeting Neanderthals. You know what I mean? And, and, and trying to play around with that. There are people who have said the same story repeatedly. Remember Betty and Barney Hill, that story? There's, there's, there's a lot that's going on here. I know that I'm going off on a tangent because I'm thinking about this. I want to tell you so much in so little time. I don't have enough time to tell you this, but what I'm telling you is that I want you to listen to me. There's something to this a lot. And I don't have any proof of it. I don't have any, I can't, I mean, I can, I can tell you a lot of um, documented eyewitness testimony. Oh, uh, Rendlesham Forest was it 1980 Rendlesham Forest. This is a military, this is a, a, a military installation where we had nuclear weapons. <laughs> and the, who was it? Lieutenant Hart or Lieutenant Colonel? It was a Christmas party. Remember that story? Christmas party, he gets a call from the MPs. Sir, we got a problem. He goes out there, he brings a tape recorder with him. I think he had a Geiger counter either that night or the night before. He goes out there and you, you can hear him screaming. And he goes, there it is. and. This guy is explaining this craft that's, you know, and that takes off and, and they said, he's crazy. He says, excuse me. He said, I'm in charge of a military base that you put me in charge of that controls nuclear weapons. Raul Rodriguez. Thank you, brother. 70 years old, huh? I'm not even talking to you. You're over the hill, pal. I'm just kidding. I love you, man. Listen to what he has to say. Did you ever see the Fox News over the Temple Mount? This, this ball, this thing, this whatever. It's a, just look at it. Did you ever see it? It's right there. Um, when we have in in um, in New York, we had in one year over Chelsea light nighttime. We had these. Um spheres no it was during the day and people were looking up 
right there in Chelsea. Whenever you hear Chelsea, it's like 23rd, 24th, West Side. And, uh, you know, they're looking and they've got these pictures and you see these spheres, these globes, these orbs. You see two, and then you see four, and then you see one, then they disappear. Then one will, they just turn off and on. They're like different, different frequencies, different wavelengths, different whatever. It's just right in front of you. Two, three, and then it's gone. My favorite is the acceleration. My favorite is that is the idea, and it's been talked about loosely about being able to warp through some kind of anti-gravitic. And I know people like Weinstein think it's ridiculous, but I love the fantasy of this. To be able to warp make a divot, an indentation in space-time, so to speak, and just flying. You're just, you're, you're not accelerating, you're falling. You, you're, you're falling. That's the motion. And what's so interesting is that if you have, that when these, these things fly like this, Saucer type devices. And by the way, Stan Friedman called them saucers. But now we're seeing all kinds of weird shapes. But in the saucer, so to speak, by the way, that was from that was from Kenneth, what's his name? He used it when he was flying in Seattle. Right around 47. That's when the shit hit the fan. 47 or so. And he saw this 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 legion, this but this battalion, this brigade of these, and he said they looked like they could, they skipped over the something like like saucers or anyway. They uh, Randall Kenneth, whatever his name is. They they used the wrong phrase. They called it a flying saucer. It's not what he said, but it was something like that. But they fly like this on Earth, but in space they fly like that. I love that. Imagine that. Imagine this. But people will tell you they're too far. Too far away. It's too far. You, you. If if they left now, they even if they traveled at the speed of light, and they can't, and the energy you would need, and and there's all this. There's this almost this contrived argument that you must say. Xander reticulized about what 30, 25, I don't know, light years away. It's a binary star system. You know that the faster you go, you, you're not going to be you're not going to be traveling thirty years. The faster you go, the faster you go towards the speed of light. The faster time kind of dilates, compresses, and you're there. It doesn't take you thirty years. But the idea of you having to get up in the morning and leave and go someplace else, when in fact you could be here, and I know people laugh at this stuff, and I'm not a physicist and I don't pretend to be it, but I think if God would sit there, God would say, go ahead, say what you're saying, go with your instinct, parallel universes, how do you like that? Um, Weinstein has what, 11, 14 different dimensions, 14? Can you understand four dimensions, 4D? No. Have you seen a tesseract? Tesseract is a 4D, it's a four-dimensional cube. You can't even imagine it. The only way you can understand it is as Sagan showed it, where you you look at it, you you have kind of a plastic concoction of this, where when the light comes through, when you see it on paper, you say, "Oh, I see it," because it doesn't make any sense. There's length, white, you know, length, width, height, and then this, this, this one. What the hell is this? Well, they go string theory goes 10, 11 dimensions. This is the stuff that we need to teach people. Hang on for a second, because this is the question I had, the most important question of all. And by the way, the reason why I'm asking this, the reason why I'm even talking about this was seconds before seconds before I got on with you, I looked at the Daily Mail article. And there was this fellow, this paraplegic, who could move things through his head. And we've been saying for the longest time, we know about that. The critter showed us how to do it. The critter showed us how. We didn't come up with that on our own. The critters showed us. Isn't that wonderful? Get ready for the best question of them all. The best. But first, this word. Well, it's time yet again to hail and salute our great friends at MyPillow.com. And if you use promo code Lionel, you get a free gift. 
No purchase necessary. I know, I know, a free gift. Gifts are free. Okay, it's a tautology, so sue me. But listen to me and listen carefully. What are we talking about here? Down comforters, flannel sheets, Giza Dream bed sheets, my pillow 2.0, body pillows, waffle blankets, couch and recliner pillows, sheets, slippers, percales. I'm not even done yet. Towels, quilts, bedspreads, mattresses, mattress covers, mattress toppers, linens, kitchen towels, bathrobes, pet blankets, pet blankets, bolster pillows, name it. Items to help you luxuriate and relax. And they're monster sellers, slippers, my slippers, slip-ons, moccasins. Think about it. What do they do at my pillow? What's their main goal? To make things real soft, plush, real comfy, comfy, or comfy as I say it. How perfect. So here's the link right now. Go to mypillow.com slash Lionel. Mypillow.com, promo code Lionel or slash Lionel, or call 800 645 4965. 800 645 4965. And watch how fast our good friend Mike Lindell answers the phone. MyPillow.com, promo code Lionel, simply and absolutely the best. This is the question that I have. It's my favorite. I have a friend of mine who is, uh, he's my age, and he's he's looking at, he's trying to find religion and trying to find God, trying to find peace, trying to find something somewhere. And I always and I always uh, commend people for doing that. I said, well, let me ask you a question. I said, I want you to, to imagine that it is possible to somehow talk to God. Whatever that, whatever that embodiment is, whatever that is, whatever spirit, just, just imagine for the sake of argument, you have I have reduced it telepathically. You don't really see him or her, it or they, just you're talking to God. And the question is that God is God. There are, what is it, a hundred trillion galaxies with a hundred trillion, the sheer numbers, the numbers are so, I, I, I mean, the numbers are, you know what a mole is, right? Mole Avogadro's number is 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd. It's one of my favorite numbers. Uh, anybody who's done organic chemistry, you know, a mole of something, you know, the, the atomic number, like 12, 12 grams is a mole. A mole is like a dozen. Uh, it's a number, um, six with 23 zeros next to it. And to show you how big that number is, if you represented each one of those digits with a, either a pea or a grain of rice, I forget which one, but anyway, you would have enough to fill enough railroad boxcars to go end to end from the earth to the moon a thousand times. So the numbers are just gargantuan. So people have always, some people look at it from the perspective of almost like a Drake equation kind of a thing. There's no way that we could be the only people out here and there's no way that we, other people can't be here and whatever. That there has to be other life. There has to be, and we're not talking, uh, you know, bacterial life, uh, even considering, you know, the Goldilocks Periods can't be can't be too close to the sun to the star and, and have oxygen and water and all that jazz. But when you have you know a hundred trillion you know numbers, the probability let's say is point zero zero one percent. That's still what a couple of billion. Whatever. Anyway, so they ask the head of astronomy from the Vatican. They say, "Is it is it consistent with the Catholic uh, Catholic uh, theology to believe?" In people from other space, from life forms from other space, could could it in fact be? And is it in any way inconsistent with uh, Catholic theology? And the the Vatican astronomer said that it is not in any way inconsistent with it, and they could be construed as our brothers and sisters, much like our uh, much like angels. Okay, angels. Now, he said, there is one question, though. What do we do with original sin? And I have a friend of mine who is so funny, he, he fancies himself as a religious type, but does not understand original sin. Original sin, as you know, is a Christian doctrine that states that humans are born 
with a tainted nature that makes them prone to sinful behavior. The doctrine is based on the sin of Adam and Eve, in which uh, Adam disobeyed God by eating uh, the forbidden fruit. I thought it was Eve, but anyway, uh, giving him uh, knowledge of good and evil. Adam then passed his sin off uh, and guilt on his defendants uh, through heredity and blah, blah, blah. Remember that one? Original sin. The human to the fact of birth inherit a tainted nature with a proclivity to sinful, and they must be forgiven. They must be redeemed. They must be cleared of that. They must have this original sin expunged. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why you're baptized. That's why you that's why Catholics have sacraments, because of the original sin. To be born again, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal savior, you must. To be re to do to, to you must do this. If you don't, and kind of erasing this this tattooed part of your soul. Okay, you got the picture. Because remember, you just can't sit back and say that's okay, God. I'll pass on this. No, 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 no. You have to redeem yourself. But here's the. Are you ready for this? Here's the issue. Are these critters? Are these people? Do they have original sin? They may not. Think about it. Now, when I tell people that, I tell people either you have two seconds, either you get that or you don't. And if I don't see an eye bug out, they don't get it. They don't get it. Do you know the implications of this? Do you know what the implications would be if somebody said, wait a minute, does anybody in the universe have original sin? They didn't have an Adam and Eve. They don't have a Genesis. They don't. They're someplace else. That's here. That's here. Did, did, they, did their um, intelligence form the way ours did? You know, from the organic muck pond of viability, did we? Did they, you know, come from the the water and tadpoles and salamanders and look? Wait a minute, what was that? Nope. Because our development is very spotty, very sketchy, very crude. Look at our ancestors from Australopithecus afarensis to Neanderthal to Homo habilis and comets and, you know, slogging around and hairy and hunter-gatherers and then little by little, bit by bit, as, as we start to develop. What if other people say, no, we didn't go through that. No, we were, we were pretty much like pretty quick. We were, our story is different. We were just here. What? Yep. Our God just made us. What? Wait a minute. You didn't go through that? Uh-uh. What if you took a critter from another planet to the Museum of Natural History and they said, what the hell is this? Well, that's our paleontology and our, what the hell is that that's neanderthal oh my god looks like an ape well we are technically what we don't have that we don't have that we don't have original sin wait a minute do you mean to tell me that from what it looks like now listen to me carefully that the son of god only came here out of tens of hundreds of thousands of trillions of galaxies and planets, this was just here? Because at the time of this, this is before Copernicus, or before, certainly before Galileo, right around the time of Ptolemy, before that, when we believed the whole, everything was geocentric. We were at the middle of the, we were at the, the middle of the universe. Everything surrounded us. Do you know what this will do to the collective sense of, of inferiority? For lack of a better word, it's like, wait a minute, you mean wait, wait, you mean to tell me? Which would make some people say, you know, this story seems 
exceedingly unlikely. What do you mean? Well, if this story is not replicated on other planets, and at the time of the Bible, there were no even any idea of other planets, the story would be that God sacrificed his son here only? And other and other planet other other systems do not enjoy this original sin. This this really makes this story seem unlikely. That's why it stops. Let me say this again. That's why the discussion stops because of the implications of this. Do you hear what I'm saying, dear? Are you getting what I'm saying? Oh, stop. That's why they don't like this. Keep going. Nobody ever goes the, does this happen on other planets? And by the way, good news, in case one of your other Jewish or or uh, Muslim or Zoroastrian or any friends like this start to laugh at you, say, excuse me, you're in on this story too. Whatever my story is, your story doesn't make sense either. Are there Jews anywhere in the universe other than here? No, I don't think so. Are there other Christians? No. Don't you think the, don't you, do we have multiple gods? Of course not. We all have one God. How do you know? Don't we have an earth God? Wait a minute. I never, what? Do we have, are there other gods? The Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not have other gods before me. First, first, I'm the Lord thy God. This, this is serious. No. So there's one God. So do you mean to tell me? Are there other crucifixion stories on other planets and other sons of God? Do they know about this? No. Do you see what I'm at? Do you see what's happening here? Tell me you understand this. Tell me you're saying, oh, I see. That really would screw things up, wouldn't it? Uh-huh. So that's why nobody wants to take this seriously. Right. That's why they don't want to go there. Because the more you look at this, the more you say, this is story it seems preposterous. And that can't be. So remember, I think it was Edie. I think Edie Crowley said something about cognitive dissonance. Whenever we are given something that doesn't make any sense, we stop thinking about it. When a relative died very old and lived a good life, but towards the end it was very old, or another relative said, well, one day when we die, we'll be in heaven and we'll see uncle or grandpa, whatever I said. You're going to see him? Yeah. Like that? Is he going to be in heaven like that forever? No. Well, what's he going to look like? Well, he'll, he won't be ill. What age is he going to be? He died at almost, you know, 93. Is he going to be like that? What happens if a child's born, let's say, in a child's, uh, it's a miscarriage or it's a stillbirth or something. How are you going to see that child? In what form? Now, when I ask that question, you see, when you're people like me, you say, that's a good question. That's a good question. Other people say, stop asking me because they can't think because they don't feel good about their story. I love this idea. This has been the story of my life, my whole life. This is the greatest story in the world. And nobody wants to talk about it. And your boyfriend, uh, Tucker Carlson, whenever he talks about UFOs, he treats it like the silliest thing in the world. He put, remember that when you have these little cartoon graphics of, they don't take it seriously. And, and uh, Eric Weinstein, bless his heart, is being so Weinstein-ish that he's missing the point. Look, there are things that I know that I cannot explain to you. Love is one of them. Love is, if you've ever seen uh, your first, well, your child or whatever, fall in love, puppy love or whatever you want to call it, you realize, oh no, because love is a mental illness. Love is, is, is an obsessive compulsive disorder 
but no known cure. They also say life is a sexually transmitted lethal disease with no cure. But love is a very dangerous thing. It is an obsessive compulsive form. It is a form of positive mental illness because it serves absolutely no... Uh, animals don't fall in love. Humans do. Okay. Now, I know that to be true. I can't prove it. I can't hook you up to some machine and show you how that's true, but I know it's true. I know it's true. I know there's love. I know it. And there may be no, no metric for it, but it's true. Get ready for this, my friends. You're going to see some stuff that's going to blow your mind. Edie Crowley says, if there could be a parallel universe, could there not be multiple deities? Absolutely. That's what I'm saying. I don't know. And as you know, Edie, there are people who will say, if you do something that calls into question my version, I have a friend of mine who is who's talking to me about Protestantism versus Catholicism. I said, do you know the anti-Semitic stuff that Martin Luther said? You know, I mean, you talk about anti-Semites. Oh, my God. He looked at me. I said, you have no idea what you're talking about, do you? You have no idea. You're giving up your life to this thing you call God. You're walking into this church and you have not the slightest idea about what the hell you're talking about. I talked to somebody the other day who said, I reject the Catholic Church. I said, well, you got to know what the Catholic Church is. What is it before you reject it? Well, I know. What is it? What makes a Catholic a Catholic and not a Protestant? What, what is it? What is it? Tell me. What is it? He couldn't answer the question. So I said, so you basically gave up something you don't even understand. I'm not a morphodite anymore. What's a morphodite? I don't know. But I'm not one. You see what I'm doing right now? You see what I'm doing right now? Can you imagine Steve Ducey doing this? Ainsley? Maybe Brian Kilmeade spending time just asking, just asking questions. Just asking questions about various things. Have you ever seen a UFO? Who here has seen one? Please tell me. Who, who has seen one? I haven't. I haven't. But one night, I took a... Remember that night we saw that thing? I said, it was a light. It was just a light. It looked like a light. It could be a star. I said, this is kind of weird. It doesn't... It looked kind of low. I took my... I said, maybe it's Venus. Maybe it's Venus. So I look at my phone. I said, where's Venus? No, Venus is back there. So what is this thing? So I took up a... I took up a... I had a camera at the time. I had a tripod. And I just took pictures. I just would look. I said, oh, there it is here. Took a picture, waited, and then it's over here. And it's over here. It's over here. I think, I don't think a planet moves that fast. I don't think a star moves that fast. This thing was, what was it? I don't know. I don't know. How many times you look up in the sky? Never. I knew an old man. I knew an old man who one time said where he kept his money. And he said he puts it in a bag and he uh, he he kept it in a tree. He has money in a, in a bag, you know, but wrapped in plastic. He kept it in a tree. And he said, I said, why did you do that? He says, nobody looks up. If they came here to find my money, they'd be digging, they'd have metal detectors, they'd tear up the you live in a trailer, interesting. It's, nobody would ever think to look in a tree. I never forgot that. We don't look up. It's the damnedest thing. We don't look up. Oh, there might be a sunset. Those people who can't take pictures always take a picture of a sunset. If you don't know what to do, take a picture of a sunset. That's what they do all the time. This is what people who have no, uh, no photo, photographic talent whatsoever. But the stuff that's out there, I would. I would love. Uh, uh, Phoenix Lights, Five Symington, 200, 300 people in Phoenix who saw this thing a mile long float over. This man said, you could hold up a newspaper and it it filled the sky. It was like you, you couldn't. The governor of Arizona, 
Uh, John McCain was very was very important. Uh, so was uh, Barry Goldwater. There are people who saw these things. Jimmy Carter did. You know who really was into it? Big time, big time. Jackie Gleason. Jackie Gleason and Reagan. Reagan. We talked about aliens. He didn't say alien. He says aliens. What he said. And he always talked about this. He says, you know, if one day we were ever attacked by aliens, aliens, there are people that I know, and I can't prove this at any stretch of the imagination, but I know people, do you have members of your family, maybe you, who for all their life, that's all they talk about. They showed an inordinate amount of interest as though they were somehow, they came into contact with something or were touched by something. Initially or at an early age, they were like led to it. The scene that is the most important from Close Encounter, Close Encounters, I guess of the third kind, is when they were both they were called Richard Dreyfus, the young boy, and the mother, and they were drawn. Remember, he was he had the potatoes, the mashed potatoes. He was drawn. It gets into your brain. There's something to that. There's something to it. It is so fascinating. And the sad part is, is that you'll never meet anyone, and listen to what I'm saying, you'll never meet anybody who can understand and follow it. They don't like the topic. They don't want to go there. They have no imagery. They have no imagination. They don't like thinking. They don't like it. It hurts them. It bothers them. They don't like thinking about anything. They get very upset. Especially when you challenge something. When you say, well, that's not what I think it is. I always like to be found or proven wrong about something. I like when somebody says, you know, look at it this way. I like changing my mind. It doesn't happen a lot. But when the facts change, I change my mind. Just like with politics, I didn't change. The Democratic Party did. My country did. Can you dig this? Can you dig this? Whitley Strieber. Remember the great Art Bell? Art Bell was wonderful. Art Bell imparted such wonder. He was wonder. Late at night, ding, 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 ding. It was that. Ding, 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 ding. Loved him. Uh, anybody who anybody who tried something different, I thought was just interesting. Just to open your mind. Open your mind. And when you find yourself, I am, by the way, do not, do not ever talk about God, love, hate, religion. People do not want to talk about that. And they will, they will turn on you and they'll say, you know, there's something, there's something wrong with you. It's like, I know, I know. That's what we don't talk about. And by the way, one thing, if you ever get a chance, I, I walked in, it was, it was kind of like a MUFON, MUFON thing. Um, Mutual UFO Network. It's it's a convention of, of believers or whatever. You will walk in, look around, turn around and leave. People with big, you know, hats and buttons. People who wear buttons. People who wear buttons. I used to like, there was a, the 9-11 um, community was interesting because they were, at first, it was very interesting. People who would say, yeah, I'm not really sure about this, until you went to a meeting and you realized, oh my God, they got buttons. Whenever people wear buttons, you know, 9-11 is an inside job. It's like, okay, all right. All righty, that's where we're going. So anyway, I know you can't do it. And people love to be apodictic. They love to be, they love to make statements. That's true, that's not true. I believe this. I don't know if I believe anything. I haven't seen any evidence of it. Try telling people that. Wasn't this fun? Now, my friend, I'm going to tell you a couple of things here. First and foremost, number one, number one, you are going to follow Mrs. L. Mrs. L. When is that Diane one coming up? I want you to go to follow Mrs. L. And she is... Go to Lynn's Warriors. She did an interview, second interview. I did one with Diane Diamond. She did it again. We've known Diane for years. When you find out what is going on in this country regarding conservatorships and guardianships, you are not going to believe it. 
this sounds like a story. This doesn't that sound boring? Conservatorships. Hmm. It's judicial slavery, judicial uh, theft. It's the most horrible thing you've ever imagined. And this goes on anytime. Anybody who doesn't like you, I can go to a court and petition. I don't think you're okay. And especially if I can be your guardian and all of a sudden you lose your rights to everything. Look at Britney Spears. Look at um, Cher's doing it with her son, Elijah Blue. Sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's beneficial. Remember Casey Kasem and... Uh, Oh, look at, look, and in a weird way too, this isn't a conservatorship, but remember Brian Wilson years ago and that boyfriend or whatever that boyfriend, whatever that guy was. It's it's a very, very, Brian Wilson is now under conservatorship because he's, it's a very, anyway, so that's at Lynn's Warriors. It's a, huh? She's working on it right now. Make sure you do that, but follow her. The stuff is incredible. Also, I have a story tonight coming out at nine o'clock. Please sign up subscribe about how i become a woman named lashandra jackson i i'm i'm changed my I'm, and by the way i i turned into her and she has blue eyes and she's french and then i turn back because if leah thomas can do it i can do that as well okay so make sure you do this now here's another one too we have an event coming up where we are going to this is not the great people at the Metropolitan Republican Club here in New York City on April the 4th, 6.30 on the Upper East Side. We're going to be there. I'm going to be there. Mrs. L will be there. And we're going to be putting on an evening. It's going to be incredible. It's going to be me, Dick Morris, Mrs. L, a woman national victims advocate named Madeline Brame, and a young man named Isaiah Vega. But before that, Dick Morris and I are going to be talking about stuff that we need to talk about. Dick Morris is, and I've known him for a long time, he is, I don't want to say he's more relevant now, but he's more relevant now than he has ever been. Because the world that existed when he was with the Clintons and all that stuff before, that's gone. So, oh, it'd be nice if I gave you the information. So here is it right now. I'm going to give you this. You can go to Eventbrite. You can go to... I'm going to have this on my uh, uh, Twitter. But let me just give it to you right now. This is the link right here, okay? And join us. Come on, say hello. And these are some serious folks. And I'll tell you what. If you'd have told me 10 years ago that I'd be going speaking at a Republican club, I'd say you're out of your mind. They're the only people the only ones who are even remotely concerned with what's happening in this world. Democrats have completely abandoned everything. And I mean that. They have abandoned everything. They are, I don't even know who they are. They've been contaminated by this. So anyway, so that's it. And the space is, it's, it's, not, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funky old townhouse. It's beautiful, beautiful kind of old New York. It's a great place. But we're going to talk about some very, very serious stuff. Because we do this, but we also go out into the into the dark, into the night. Mrs. L was in, bless her heart, in Albany, the state capitol, all day today. Three o'clock in the morning. I dropped her off at six o'clock. No, before six o'clock. Before six o'clock this morning. In the dark. Taking a bus with her fellow her fellow warriors to, to walk through the halls of the capitol. Because you could sit back and you can, you know, hope things change or you can try to fix it yourself. In any event, thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks you. Thank you for thinking. Keep an open mind. And remember one thing. You don't know anything. You don't know anything at all. You can spend the rest of your life studying a subject and you still don't know anything. And that's what I love. Because you'll never even get close to figuring out the truth. But you'll get closer than you were before. So anyway, exploration is dangerous because sometimes you find out stuff you didn't think you'd run into. All right, dear friends, have a great and glorious day. I had a wonderful time talking with you. An hour and four minutes. I love it. And I love you because you are so beautiful to me. Can't you see? You are so beautiful to me. All right, folks, see you tomorrow at 8 a.m. And don't forget the monkey's dead. The show's over. Sue you. Da -da.